Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, we begin once again in Chicago after the final night of the Democratic National Convention. Just weeks after President Biden announced he would not seek re-election, Vice President Kamala Harris introduced herself to the nation as the new Democratic nominee in an acceptance speech that set out her vision to lead the country forward. Harris discussed her upbringing and her experience as a prosecutor while seeking to offer a unifying message. I promise to be a president for all Americans. You can always trust me to put country above party and self. Kamala Harris argued she's best positioned to tackle issues like the economy, immigration and crime. And she used much of her speech to contrast her agenda with that of Republican rival Donald Trump. Harris says he would only prioritize himself. And she described the Republican nominee as an unserious man who presents a serious threat to democracy and personal freedoms. He plans to create a national anti-abortion coordinator and force states to report on women's miscarriages and abortions. Simply put, they are out of their minds. Well, outside the DNC, protesters staged multiple demonstrations over Israel's war in Gaza. Kamala Harris addressed the issue during her speech, calling for a ceasefire. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. Vice President Harris also said Israel has a right to self-defense. Before Kamala Harris's keynote address, a broad coalition of Democrats spoke at the DNC, including North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper and Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And we're getting more reaction from Chicago. Karen Bloomberg political contributor Jeannie Shianzano said Harris tried to differentiate herself from her former running mate. She also didn't lean in on her role as vice president. A lot on prosecutor, right. not a lot on VP, and not a lot on Joe Biden. Once again, think of how many times we heard Donald Trump versus Joe Biden in that speech. And fellow Bloomberg contributor Rick Davis said Harris did not hold back on Trump. Last night we heard Oprah give a joyful speech. This was sober night, and she definitely took it to Donald Trump in a way, frankly, no other person on the stage yeah. in four nights did it. Bloomberg's Rick Davis says Kamala Harris showed she is ready to take Trump on directly. And the Republican nominee offered his own reaction, Nathan. Trump called into Fox News after Harris's speech, saying she hasn't accomplished much as vice president. The biggest reaction is why didn't she do the things that she's complaining about? All of these things that she talked about, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do everything, but she didn't do any of it. In addition to that conversation with Fox News, Donald Trump also made several posts on his social media platform, Truth Social, providing real-time critiques of Harris's speech. And earlier in the day, Karen, Trump offered a policy proposal on immigration threatening tariffs on nations that don't take migrants back. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has that story. This is an indication that his immigration and trade policy could become closely intertwined. It is also a message that he will aggressively deport migrants that his administration deems should not be in the country. He says, quote, if countries don't accept the migrants back, we do no trade with those countries and we charge them big tariffs, end quote. While in Arizona, he again promised that he would complete the building of the wall. Immigration has become the keystone of his campaign. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Ed, thanks. Well, turning to the markets now with all eyes on Jackson Hole. Fed Chair Jay Powell will give his keynote address today at 10 a.m. Wall Street time at the Central Bank's annual symposium in Wyoming. And Bloomberg's Michael McKee has a preview. All Wall Street wants to know, how far will he go? Investors would love a rate cut pledge from Chairman Powell. That's not likely. He's also unlikely to say how far the Fed will cut or what their next steps will be. Instead, expect acknowledgement that the Fed is close to changing rates as long as the incoming financial data meets forecasts. 
For Wall Street, Powell just raising this subject may be enough. There's also interest in how much he might talk about the Fed's framework review, which the central bank begins to undertake this fall. The transmission of monetary policy is the topic of this year's symposium. All right, it's Bloomberg's Michael McKee with us from Jackson Hole this morning. Mike, thanks. Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed Alarian says Powell also has an opportunity to tamp down recent market volatility on the economic outlook. We should hope for the Fed to start restoring the policy anchor. The way you do that is you tell people where you see the destination and how you think you're going to get there. That's what I think he should do. Whether he does or not, I'm not sure. Mohamed Alarian of Bloomberg Opinion says he thinks the Fed will realistically ease borrowing by 75 basis points by the end of the year. Stick with Bloomberg for our coverage of Chairman Powell's Jackson Hole speech on a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance live from Wyoming with our Tom Keene and Lisa Abramowitz. Live coverage begins at 9 a.m. Wall Street time, an hour before the speech on Bloomberg Radio and Television. And Nathan J. Powell is not the only central banker we're hearing from today. Kazuo Ueda, the head of the Bank of Japan, and reiterated his hawkish stance as the BOJ unwinds years of ultra-easy settings. Speaking through an interpreter, the Bank of Japan governor says it's on a path toward higher interest rates should data and inflation cooperate. If we are unable to confirm a rising certainty that the economy and prices will stay in line with forecasts, then there's no change to our stance and we'll continue to adjust the degree of easing. Bank of Japan's Kazuo Ueda was addressing questions from Parliament today, his first public remark since the global market route earlier this month. The yen rose against the dollar on signals that more rate hikes are forthcoming. And we're keeping our eyes north of the border, Karen. Canada's two largest railways are preparing to restart operations after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government stepped in to end a labor dispute. The country's labor minister says he's asked the Canada Industrial Relations Board to impose binding arbitration on Canadian National Railway, Canadian in Pacific Kansas City and the Teamsters. He also ordered the board to direct the parties to extend their current contract. The labor minister says he is confident the measures will get the trains rolling again and end a lockout that started yesterday. And it's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Michael Barr. Michael, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Four of the five men in the so-called Central Park Five wrongfully convicted in the 1989 rape of a Central Park jogger in New York appeared at the Democratic National Convention last night. Yusuf Salam is now a city councilman representing Harlem, who has long criticized Donald Trump's reaction to the case. America will finally say goodbye to that hateful man. Reverend Al Sharpton introduced the men and talked about Trump calling for New York to adopt the death penalty for violent crimes during the Central Park Five trial. Sharpton also supported the Harris Walls ticket. We have fought too hard for women to be told to get out of the kitchen. We are now on our way to the Oval Office. We won't go back. Reverend Sharpton went on to say, we are going to realize Shirley Chisholm's dream. In 1972, Chisholm, who represented New York's 12th Congressional District, became the first black candidate for a major party nomination for president and the first woman to run for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. A 32-year-old woman has been charged after police said she was driving under the influence and crashed in a head-on collision traveling the wrong way on the Southern State Parkway. The Long Island crash yesterday killed Carrie Bedrick's nine-year-old son. Authorities say Bedrick from Centerport was fleeing an attempted traffic stop by a Suffolk County deputy sheriff when she eventually drove into oncoming traffic and set off a four-car crash. A former politician and accused murderer took the stand in his own defense in Las Vegas. Robert Tellis told the jury he did not kill newspaper reporter Jeff German, who wrote critical articles about him. Tellis's attorney repeatedly advised him not to take the stand, but Tellis insisted on testifying. The prosecution says the evidence against him is just overwhelming. How in the world does your DNA get underneath Mr. Gehrman's fingernails? I don't know because I did not kill Mr. Gehrman. One piece of evidence prosecutors don't have is the murder weapon. Charges filed against a New York City park worker in the murder of a Venezuelan immigrant. 23-year-old Elijah Mitchell of Queens is charged with murder as a hate crime for the shooting death of 30-year-old Rodriguez Marcano. 
Authorities say Mitchell got into an argument with Marcano three days prior to the shooting as he was sleeping on a park bench. Prosecutors say Mitchell went back to Marcano to, quote, settle the score and allegedly shot him in the chest. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With the Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg, Karen. All right, Michael Barr, thank you. Time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashauer. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Ten-game road trip for the Mets. They're not back in New York until September. First stop, San Diego. The Padres have been hot since the All-Star break. Mets won the opener 8-3, to three, pulled away with a five-run ninth inning. They had 17 hits, three each for Pete Alonso and Jeff McNeil. Mark Vientos drove in three. Luis Severino got the win. Atlanta beat the Phillies to stay game and a half ahead of the Mets. Stadium, first time in Yankee history. They gave up a hit to open the game. Did not allow another hit. A one hit shutout of Cleveland. Garrett Cole and three relievers. Aaron Judge opened the scoring. Yet another home run number 48. That came fourth inning. An inning later, another long ball. Runners go. The pitch reached for and lifted high in the air. Center field. Freeman's moving back. Freeman's near the wall. He leaps at the wall and it's gone! Out to the netting! Over Monument Park in straightaway center field. A scud missile off the bat of John Carlos Stanton. He hits a three-run homer. On WFAN, Yanks blanked the Guardians 6-0 in Baltimore. Lost 6-0. Held the three hits by Houston. Yankees now game and a half. Head of the Orioles and the Yanks host Colorado tonight. Looks like Jazz Chisholm will be back in the lineup sooner than expected from his elbow injury. Seattle Mariners fired Scott Service. He'd been their manager since 2016. WNBA, the Liberty now 25-4 and with a win over Dallas. BMW Golf in Colorado. Keegan Bradley, 666, leads by one over Hideki Matsuyama, who won last week in Memphis. For what it's worth, the Chicago Bears went 4-0 in the preseason with a win in Kansas City. The two-time defending Super Bowl champs went 0-3. Scary moment, early second half, Bears defensive back Douglas Coleman made a tackle, lay motionless on the field, had to be taken by ambulance to a nearby hospital. Coleman did give the thumbs-up sign. He does have movement in his limbs. John Stashower, Bloomberg Sports, Kerry Nathan. Coast to coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. Kamala Harris made a pitch for progress as she capped off the Democratic National Convention in Chicago with her acceptance speech to be the party's new standard bearer. We are charting a new way forward. with a strong and growing middle class because we know a strong middle class has always been critical to America's success. Let's get more now on what we heard from the last four nights in Chicago. We're joined this morning after by Terry Haynes, the founder of Pangea Policy. Great to speak with you this morning, Terry. Your reaction to Harris's speech. Hi, Nathan. Good morning. Uh, uh, Harris needed to do two things uh, effectively. Firstly, she needed to stigmatize Trump. Uh, and secondly, she needed to make uh, the t- her, her tickets, Harris Waltz and the party, feel normal, welcoming, a big tent, a place you want to be. This is uh, – people are calling this the vibiness of the, the, of the thing. Uh, and I thought that she did both of those very well. Uh, you know, that said uh, – Preaching to the converted, as everyone has been doing all week, is the easy part. And now she's going to have to uh, to move into talking to swing states and talking to persuadables and undecideds. Uh, that's the hard part. But uh, but she set herself up well to do that. So I'd say that her speech and the week were uh, both were a success. Does she need to do more to lay out a policy that will mollify a lot of? people in business who might be concerned about the new way forward that Harris could take the country after President Biden? Well, a little bit, yeah. She, she's stumbling. There's two things, really. One is she's kind of stumbling around on uh, on policy and you know, and not doing herself a lot of favors. Uh, the, the whole uh, the, the, the slew of policy proposals that came out last Friday led by the uh, the price gouging uh, business, uh, you know, the campaign realizes, I mean, they're, they're in a little bit of a spaghetti uh, politics mode right now. They're throwing things up on the wall to see what best sticks with, uh, with voters and, and, uh, as, and business as well. And, uh, you know, 
a lot of that stuff didn't stick well, uh, and she's been trying to uh, keep distance from it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it continues to be a center point of her campaign. Uh, that kind of muddled messaging is uh, is not going to go well, uh, I think, with uh, with Wall Street, and she's going to have some uh, some work to do with those folks. But then again, if she can't get the uh, the, the swing voters to begin with, there's no point in uh, talking to Wall Street, is there? In our last minute, Terry, what do you expect going forward? We are waiting for, among other things, a speech this afternoon from Robert F. Kennedy Jr., where he's expected to end his campaign and possibly endorse Trump. Does that well, matter? Um, you know, I think it matters less than uh, than most people think. I think the withdrawal impact of RFK Jr. really is almost nil. Uh, Kennedy's numbers have been falling through the floor. Or they're down to you know, roughly 4% nationally. Uh, some RFK Jr. supporters have probably have already gone to Harris. Others might stick to Trump. But it's uh, – and I think the vast majority of those people end up undecided for a while and end up uh, trying to figure out – uh, exactly where they should go and why. So, uh, you know, but again, it's a, we're talking about a percentage or two at this point. So uh, I, I really don't think that uh, Kennedy's withdrawal makes much difference. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.